Creationism and Ancient Near Eastern Evolutionary Ideas. We've been going through the book, uh, The Genesis Account of Origins, or The Genesis Creation Account, and its reverberations in the Old Testament, and its companion volume, He Spoke and It Was, Divine Creation in the Old Testament, um, both of which cover the same ground, the first on uh, more academic, uh, uh, in a more depth, and the second one is in a more popularized form. There's the cover of the two books, uh, the covers of the two books together. And um, we are now on chapter 9, Biblical Creationism and Ancient Near Eastern Evolutionary Ideas. Uh, it's by Angel Rodriguez um, of the Biblical Research Institute. And it is entitled, uh, pardon me, it starts out, this, the introduction is, this study seeks to explore the presence of ideas related to what we call today natural evolution in ancient Near Eastern literature, placing per particular emphasis on Egypt. Each text will be explored within its own specific religious and cultural context before any attempt is made to establish cross-cultural comparisons. With respect to the biblical text, especially Genesis 1 through 3, it will be studied in the final form in which it reached us, that is, its canonical form. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, and there will be ellipses here and there, and a couple of uh, words that I have inserted, they'll all be in, in yellow so you can distinguish them. The study of ancient Near Eastern texts could help us place the biblical text in a context that will allow us to notice details that we may otherwise have overlooked. Theogony and cosmogony in the ancient Near East. And we're going to get to a greater uh, definition of theogony in just a minute, but let me just say up front that it comes from the birth of the gods. Archaeologists have found a significant amount of written and iconographic materials in the ancient Near East that have helped scholars gain a better understanding of the Sumerian and Akkadian cultures and religions. More recently, there has been an emphasis on the influence of those cultures on Western thinking. Egypt has always pardon me, intrigued the Western world to the point of fascination. Interestingly, some elements of the cosmogonies of the ancient Near East, including Egypt, phrased in mythological language, appear to have found a more sophisticated expression in modern cosmogony and some theories on the origin of life. These elements will be the focus of this study. Before creation. Egyptians raised the question of origins by asking first, what was there before creation or beyond the actual cosmos? They basically recognized that there was no final answer to that question. When addressing that specific concern, they used statements of denial. Denial is a river in Egypt, of course. Um, thus, for instance, Egyptian text would say that before creation there was no space, no matter, no names, there was neither birth nor death. Nothing had yet come into being. This formula was used to indicate a radical difference between what is and what was not. Here are some more typical examples in the Egyptian myths. and um, The references uh, are at the end of the, uh, or in the notes, footnotes. When the heaven had not yet come into being, when the earth had not yet come into being, when two river, the two river banks had not yet come into being. Interesting, they're sort of parochial that the two river banks are the most important things in, in the world. Um, when they're not yet come into being, that fear which arose because of the eye of Horus. When the heavens had not yet come into being, when the earth had not yet come into being, when men had not yet come into being, when the gods had not yet been born, when death had not yet come into being, and some of you may kind of notice a similarity between this and Genesis, uh, except that um, in Genesis it's the, the bad things hadn't come yet, whereas here it's good things had not come, well, some of them anyway. When two things in this land had not yet come into being. And there's the footnote. But Egyptians also speculated that beyond the cosmos we could find what was always there, namely darkness and a limitless ocean of primeval waters called noon. 
This was a lifeless, motionless state of absolute inertness and non-existence. Although if you have waters, they, it seems like they do exist. Um, origin of life. There were no gods since the time before creation. So properly speaking, creation does not begin with cosmogony, how the universe came to be, but with a theogony, how the gods came to be. That leads, us, leads to, or is for all practical purposes, a cosmogony. In fact, ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies all began with theogony. For Egyptians in particular, the next logical question would have been, how did what is come into being? How did the gods come into existence? An Egyptian text states that Amun is the god who was in the very beginning, when no god had yet come into being, when no name of anything had yet been named. According to the Hermopolitan, Hermopolitan creation theology, Amun was the creator god. The statement just quoted gives the impression that he was already there at the beginning or that he was eternal, but that is not the case. It is at this point in Egyptian thought that elements of evolutionary thinking surface. But before we examine these ideas, it would be helpful to know about the main Egyptian theological centers. There were four main theological centers in Egypt, and they each had different approaches to an emphasis on creation. But some of the basic elements of the creation myth remained the same. In Heliopolis, the creator god was Atum. In Hermopolis, the creation was the result of the act of eight primeval gods, the Ogdoed, although Thoth was also considered a creator god. In Thebes, the creator god was Ammon. And finally, in Memphite theology, Ptah was the creator god. Its main emphasis was on creation through the word. These different systems rested on remarkably similar underlying ideas and were not necessarily in competition with each other. If you rename stuff, uh, you can come to pretty much the same conclusions afterwards. The Heliopolitan theology of origins will be the main focus because it is the best known and perhaps the most important of the early Egyptian cosmogonies. Besides, it provided the basis for all later speculations about origins in Egypt. In this theology, the creator god is Atum. Um, it's interesting to ask the question whether Atum and Aten are uh, etymologically related uh, as Ichnaten. The origin of this god takes us into the realm of evolutionary ideas. And this is part of a, a statement spoken by Nun, the background of creation, I am the waters unique without second. And then the evolution of creation, that is where I evolved. On the great occasion of my floating that happened to me, I am the one who once evolved, circlet who is in his egg. I am the one who began therein in the waters. See, the flood is subtracted from me. See, I am the remainder. I made my body evolve through my own effectiveness. I am the one who made me. I built myself as I wished, according to my heart. The event took place a long time ago, when there were only the primeval waters. Atom describes and explains how he came into being in the absence of life. Therefore, the myth portrays an important Egyptian understanding of the origin of matter and life. Atom's existence begins within the waters through a process of self-development or evolution. Remember evolution in the widest meaning of the term simply means change, uh, usually with the idea of development. Um, and that's how it's being used here, not in a very specific uh, form such as Darwinian evolution where there's a specific mechanism involved. The evolutionary process begins with a sudden appearance and development of an egg within the waters of non-existence. After a long but undefined period, and that's a quote, the egg or atom rises and floats on the surface of the waters where it will evolve into the primeval mound or hill where atom will stand. At this stage, atom and the mound are a unity of undifferentiated matter, a cosmic stem cell. The egg and the mound are atom at different stages of development. I made my body evolve through my own effectiveness. I am the one who made me. 
Such phrases speak about self-causality and total independence from anything else, but also development. The Egyptians are describing what would what we would call a cosmic singularity, totally independent of any external force of divine origin. This is the moment when life springs into existence by itself. The Egyptian verb translated to evolve is caper, and we're going to run into that verb later on, and means to change, develop, evolve. It is used quite often to refer to Atom as the self-evolving one. Within the with the creation of air, space, air, and sky, Atom will evolve and become even more to become the sun god, Ray, also called Atom Ray. This creation myth is a mythological expression of the spontaneous generation of a unique life from which all life will develop. We call this an act of original spontaneous generation. This has led an Egyptologist to suggest not Rodriguez himself, although he's quoting him, that there are some Egyptian texts that deserve, quote, to be considered a contribution to the philosophical or scientific literature on evolution. So other people see the similarity. Some of the Egyptian ideas that have been discussed are also found in a number of Sumerian and Akkadian texts. According to some of them, creation occurs by means of spontaneous generation and sexual reproduction. As in Egypt and in modern science, in the Mesopotamian civilization, it was assumed that everything now in existence went back to a simple element. According to Enuma Elish, this simple element was two bodies of water. It is in the mixing of the two, and we'll come back to that, that they require spontaneously divine procreative powers, personified as the god Apsu, or sweet water, such as you would find in the Tigris or the Euphrates, and the goddess Tiamat, or sea water, salt water. It was within these two that the gods are formed. The idea of spontaneous generation, which is implicit in the previous text, is explicitly expressed in a bilingual Sumerio-Babylonian incantation. Heaven was created of its own accord. Earth was created of its own accord. Heaven was abyss. Earth was abyss. This is a case in which spontaneous generation of heaven and earth, namely the universe, is proclaimed, but then we are told that there was in fact no heaven and earth, but only a body of water, which is in the implication of the third line quoted. It would appear that it is within this body of water that the gods generated themselves. There is another text dated to the post-early Babylonian period, about 1400 BC, containing a prayer to the moon god Nanaswen, a creator god, expressing the idea of spontaneous generation. O Lord, this is to the moon, hero of the gods who is exalted in heaven and on earth, Father Nana, Gord, uh, Lord Anshar, hero of the gods, fruit which is self-created of lofty form. And those ellipses are in the original, or at least in uh, Rodriguez's book. Um, the concept of the self-generation of the moon was quite common and was associated with the fact that during the month it grew in size, disappeared and died, and then came to life again by its own efforts. In any case, it was from these self-created deities that the rest of the cosmos came into being. In other words, the simple diversified itself. This idea is explored more carefully by the Egyptians. Diversification of life. Atom is not simply atom, but the totality of the cosmos. Like the cosmic egg in modern cosmogony, everything in the cosmos was compressed in atom. In a sense, it could be said that he turned himself into the cosmos. Atom was not the creator, but rather the origin. Everything came into being from him. And again, that's a quote. It is through a process of differentiation that undifferentiated matter will shape the cosmos. This process begins with the origination of Shu and Tefnut, male and female. In Egyptian cosmology, they constitute the air or void that separates the sky from the earth. Probably more important, what we have here is the creation of sexually differentiated deities. Their creation is described in different ways that is, through masturbation or through sneezing. But there is a text 
in which a more analytical approach is taken when relating the origin of Shu. It is recited in the first person singular by the deceased who is trying to identify himself, identifying himself or herself with the Ba or the personality or soul of Shu. I am the Ba of Shu, the God mysterious of form. It is in the body of the self-evolving God that I have become tied together. I am the utmost extent of the self-evolving God. It is in him that I have evolved. I am the one who is millions, who hears the affairs of millions. And uh, skipping a little more, it is in the body of the great self-evolving God that I have evolved. For he created me in his heart, made me in his effectiveness, and exhaled me through his nose. Pardon me, from his nose. I am one exhale-like of form. He did not give me birth with his mouth. He did not conceive me with his fist. He exhaled me through his, from his nose. I'm not sure what difference that makes, but that's the way the thing reads. The creation of Shu and his twin sister Tefnut is not through procreation, but through development and differentiation. Another text says, I was not built in the womb. I was not tied together in the egg. I was not conceived by conception. He is part of the process of self-evolution or development of Adam. From the mythological perspective, one could perhaps conceive of Adam as an androgynous monad who is now evolving into a plurality or at first into a duality of gender differentiation. The process of transformation of the actualization of the potentiality of the original undifferentiated matter begins with Shu and Tefnut. From this point on, the Heliopolitan theology of creation is mainly based on procreation among the gods. But even there, the idea of the self-development of Atom is maintained. It is through procreation that the potential compressed in Atom, the millions in him, will actualize itself. In the Heliopolitan cosmogenic, cosmogonic model, the central concept is the coming into being of the cosmos as opposed to its creation. That is, it wasn't made by somebody else. It was, it kind of, I guess you'd say, evolved. It may not be too far-fetched to suggest that Heliopolis, in a sense, deals with, quote, with the rules of the Big Bang. And again, that's not Rodriguez's comment, although... He does quote it. Uh, time and creation. In the Sumero Babylonian literature, time was one of the basic elements from which everything that now existed originated. The idea is found in a text dealing with the ancestry of Anu. There is a pair of gods called Duri, male, and Deri, or female. The combination of the two names means ever and ever. Duri, Deri, I guess indicating that time was considered to be fundamental in the emergence of everything else. It is clear that the idea of time as a personified creature is ancient and is also found in Phoenician, Iranian, and Indian speculations and among some Greek thinkers. In the case of Phoenicia, the god Ulomas is mentioned in its cosmology. The, the name is etymologically related to the Hebrew term olam, um, Adolam is forever. Eternity, world. We also know that during the second millennium BC, there was a West Semitic god called Alamu. So um, there's a, a similarity there. Among the Greeks, the god Kronos played an important role in creation. In the semi philosophical cosmology of uh, Phariseides of Syros, Kronos or time, not to be confused with Kronos, C-R-O-N-O-S, which we'll run into later, is personified. Uh, one in Greek has a, a key and the other one has a kappa. Is personified and described as one without beginning who created from his semen, without a consort, fire, wind, and water. From these, the world developed. The matter of the time, the moment when creation took place, is not addressed in the Egyptian literature. It is clear that the Egyptian understanding of time was primarily linear. It has been suggested that there was an Egyptian god of time and his presence was possibly reflected in the Egyptian god Thoth, who is the god of the moon and of the lunar calendar 
and thus of time. He was the inaugurator of time, who reckoned time and distinguished months and years. Thoth had a wide range of his responsibilities, for example, nature, cosmology, writing, science, including that of creator god in Hermopolis. If this suggestion is valid, there was an Egyptian god of time who participated in the creation of the cosmos. We know for sure that in Egyptian, creation occurred at the first time, which, quote, does not just mean the beginning. It only means the beginning of an event. Time does not exclude the period after the event. On the contrary, it implies that other times followed, in principle, times without number. And close quote. Again, those are his ellipses. We do find the expression millions of years as referring to the time from the origin of the creator God to the end of all things. In that same context, we even read about millions of many millions with, of years implied. This way of speaking should not, only be, should not be only understood as a way of expressing the idea of eternity, but as a statement of a deep time chronology that would lead to the end of the cosmos. After many millions of years, it, it finally ends. The well-ordered cosmos is not eternal, and neither are the gods and humans who inhabit it. An Egyptian text announcing the return of everything to its state before the creation is found in the Book of the Dead, and in manuscripts dating back to about the 18th and 19th dynasties. The text narrates a con conversation between Atom and Osiris. And uh, it starts out with Osiris saying, O Atom, what does it mean that I go to the desert, the land of silence, which has no water and has no air, and which is greatly deep, dark, and lacking? Live in it and contentment, answers Atom. But there is no sexual pleasure in it. It is in exchange for water and air than sexual pl pleasure that I have given spiritual blessedness, contentment in exchange for bread and beer, so says Adam. It, it is too much for me, my Lord, not to see your face. Uh, and um, Adam then says, indeed, I shall not suffer that you lack. Doesn't sound very sympathetic. And then... Uh, what is the span of my life? So says Osiris. You shall be for millions of millions of years, a lifetime of millions. Then I shall destroy all I have made. This land will return into the abyss, into the flood, as it, in its former state. It is I who shall remain together with Osiris, having made my transformations into other snakes. Other snakes? Uh, which mankind will not know, nor God see, whatever that means. This is indeed a very dark view of the future of the cosmos, quite similar to what some contemporary cosmologists anticipating happen, anticipate happening millions of years from now. The expanding universe, they say, may experience a big crunch, and that will bring everything, including life itself, to an end. The Egyptians also believed that the whole cosmos would be pulled back into itself, Thus, returning to the darkness and inertia of the pre-creation watery condition. A Ptolemaic text says that at, the, at that moment, quote, there is no God. Ptolemy is, uh, uh, the Ptolemies ruled Egypt from about, well, shortly after the time of Alexander the Great until uh, the reign of Cleopatra. Um, who gave up her throne basically to the Romans. Uh, there is no God, there is no goddess who will make himself or herself into another snake. It would appear that at the end only Adam and Osiris remain in that they change back into the enduring original form of a snake, that is, into the same form or rather formlessness which the eternal enemy of the gods, Apophis, possesses as a power of chaos. Um, I do recall reading about a snake elsewhere, which didn't turn out to be so good. But the phrase, having made my transformations into other snakes which mankind will not know nor God see, could indicate that they do not exist. 
what cannot be known by humans and cannot be seen by the gods is what does not exist. But perhaps there was also the possibility of rebirth and therefore the chance for a new beginning. So maybe we do have a cyclic universe if the Egyptians are correct. Origin of theogonic and cosmogonic speculations. The speculations of the Egyptians concerning the origin of life and matter are to some extent based on their observation of nature and the conclusions drawn from it. The idea of the primeval mound was probably based on their experience during the flooding of the Nile. During the summer, the river began to swell until it covered the flat lands beyond its banks. The waters brought with it an excellent load of fertilizing silt. It doesn't do that so much anymore after the Swan Dam has been put in. As the waters began to decrease, the first things that appeared were mounds of fertile mud ready to be seeded. When the mounds of slime were bathed by the rays of the sun, there was an explosion of new life on them. This led the Egyptians to conclude, quote, that there is special life-giving power in this slime. They also had observed the dung beetle, the scarab, and specifically the so-called rollers, which the Egyptians associated with the fertile mounds. The female makes a spherical bowel of dung in what, inside of which she deposits her eggs. At the proper moment, the young emerge from the dung ball as though a spontaneous, as through a spontaneous generation of life. The scarab became a symbol of life. The Egyptian word for the scarab is kafir. That's right, etymologically related to the verb kafir, to develop, evolve. And to the solar de deity, kafir, sometimes phrased atom kafir. And uh, one of the uh, pyramids was built by a pharaoh who named himself Kefri. We find a similar situation in Mesopotamian myths. Ancient Mesopotamians began from what they observed in nature and through speculations projected it back to primeval times. Their speculations were apparently based, quote, on observations of how new land came into being. Mesopotamia is alluvial, formed by silt brought down by the rivers. It is the situation at the mouth of the rivers where the sweet waters, Apsu, flow into the salt waters of the sea, Tiamat, and deposit their load of silt to form new land that has been projected backward to the beginnings. They, like the Egyptians, moved from what they observed in nature to cosmogonic speculations. So if you like, in a certain sense, they were being scientific. Influence of ancient Near Eastern theogonies. Our discussion has shown that, a cre that creation myths in Egypt and Mesopotamia began with a theogony and were based on the spontaneous generation of divine life out of which a process of diversification was initiated that brought into existence everything else. These ideas were well known throughout the ancient Near East and influenced Greek mythology. Scholars in Greek classical literature have realized that the ancient Near East was not only the geographic context of Greece, but it's also its cultural context, and that Greek religion was influenced by the ancient Near East. It is now well accepted that Hesiod's Theogony, that's right, it's an actual Greek word, came from the title of that book, written around 700 BC, was influenced by ancient Near Eastern Theogonic myths. Scholars are still debating how these ideas reached Greece. Current consensus considers the Phoenicians as the mediators of elements of ancient Near Eastern theogonies and cosmologies throughout the Aegean area. Hesiod's Theogony is a masterful piece of literature that influenced Greek cosmology uh, or cosmogony in significant ways. Uh, not surprising. In it, Hesiod narrates that the origin of the God and the cosmos comes from the very beginnings to the final triumph. I'm, I'm sorry, he narrates this from the very beginnings to the final triumph of Zeus, uh, which interestingly enough in his original is titled Dios, D-I-O-S, well, Delta, Iota, Omicron, Sigma, um, which uh, has carried through to Spanish in the, the word for God. We are interested in the section of Theogony describing the origin of the gods. Hesiod wants the muses to inform him about the origin of everything. And here is the beginning of the Theogony. Actually, be precise, it is line 116 
there's a big introduction before that. In truth, first of all, chasm came to be, and then broad-breasted earth, and to be precise, it's Gaia, from which we get the word geology through an interesting derivation. Um, the ever-immovable seat of all the immortals who possess snowy Olympics, Olympus's peak in murky, murky Tartarus in the depths of the broad path earth. And Eros, who is the most beautiful among the immortal gods, the limb melter, he who overpowers the mind and the thoughtful counsel of all the gods and of all human beings in their breasts. From chasm, Erebus and black night came to be, and then ether and day came forth from night, who conceived and bore them after mingling love with Erebus. Earth, first of all, bore starry sky equal to herself to cover her on every side. Again, that's Gaia. And uh, starry Uranus, from which we get the name of our planet Uranus. Or Uranus, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Um, equal to herself to cover her on every side. So that she would be the ever-removable seat for the blessed gods. She bore, and she bore the high mountains, the graceful haunts of the goddesses, nymphs who dwell on the wooded mountains. And she also bore the barren sea, seething with its swell, Pontus, without delightful love. And then having bedded with sky, Uranus, she bore deep eddying ocean and uh, uh, I think that's Oceanus, and uh, Coeus, and Creus, and Hyperion, and Iapetus, Ea and uh, Thea, and Rhea, and Themis, and uh, Nemos, Nemosine, and golden-crowned uh, golden Phoebe, and lovely Tethys. After this, Cronus was born, and that's C-R, uh, or it's actually Kappa instead of the key that, for time. Cronus was born, the youngest of all, crooked counseled, the most terrible of her children, and he hated his vigorous father, and in turn was hated by his son Zeus, who took over for him. The text suggests that at the beginning, when there was nothing, chasm or chaos, it's actually, it is chaos in the original Greek, um, Gaia, Tartarus, and Eros originated by themselves. The process of diversification was ready to begin. Out of chasm and what appeared to be an emanation or a self-development came Erebus and night. Earth self-generated sky, Uranus, and Pontus, or sea. The other gods came into existence through procreation. The text becomes a succession myth describing the supremacy of sky, Uranus, and how Cronus, the corn harvest god, castrated him and assumed supremacy. Zeus rebelled against his father Cronus, became the supreme god, and fought against the Titans and the monster Typhon. The basic thrust of the narrative is similar to that of the Enuma Elish, with its emphasis on succession and overcoming the enemy in order for Marduk to become the supreme god, Marduk being the god of Babylon and Zeus being the god of the Greeks. Creation through self-generation and procreation, fundamental in the Mesopotamian Egypt, is also present in Hesiod. Ancient Near Eastern anthropologies, how they viewed how people came to be. In some of the ancient Near Eastern myths dealing with the origin of humans, we, find, we also find ideas that are today associated with evolutionary thinking. This does not seem to be the case in Egypt where we do not find a myth dealing with the creation of humans. They don't even deal with it. What we find is a simple statement that became the common Egyptian view on the topic. The creator God says, I made the gods evolve from my sweat, while people are from the tears of my eye. Somehow the sun god had temporary blindness, and from the tears of his weeping eye, humans came into existence. Therefore, to be human, quote, means that he is destined never to partake in the clear sight of the god. Affliction blights everything he sees, thinks, and does. The understanding of humans is negative. In Sumerian literature, there are some texts addressing the original condition of humans that contain concepts associated today with natural evolution. The first text we would like to quote is found in the cosmogonic introduction to the disputation between you and wheat, 
very popular in the old Babylonian period, 1500 BC. The text describes a primitive condition of humans as follows. The people of those distant days knew not bread to eat, they knew not cloth to wear, they went about in land with naked limbs, eating grass with their mouths like sheep, and drinking water from the ditches. Nothing is said in this text about how these humans were created. What the text described happened in a very distant time, suggesting that since then, the condition of humans have changed, has changed. At one time, they behaved like animals and did not know anything about ag agriculture and animal husbandry. Notice that at this early stage of human development, uh, humans ate only grass. The idea is not that they were vegetarians, but that they were like animals, feeding themselves from the grass and drinking water like animals. They looked and behaved like animals. This comes very close to describing what we call hominids today. The text goes on to indicate that the gods, quote, discovered the advantage of ag agriculture and as animal husbandry for themselves, but their human servants without those means could not satisfy them. Enki wishing to increase human efficiency for the ultimate benefit of the gods. He's not doing this for humans. He's doing this so they can get more, uh, the gods can get more out of the humans. Persuades Enlil to communicate to the human race the secrets of farming and animal husbandry. And again, that's a quote. In this case, the evolution from a pre-fully human condition to humans as social beings happened through divine intervention, which is not the typical evolutionary story. For our, purposes, for our purpose, what is important is that, according to this text, the human race was originally created animal-like. Now, this same two-stage two development is applied to the experience of an individual in the Akkadian Epic of Gilgamesh, probably written about 1900 BC. The storyline is centered on Gilgamesh, the ruler of the city of Uruk. He was, uh, or Uruk. He was a semi-divine being who, because of his powerful personality, drove on his poor subjects. Neither men nor women ever had respite from him. The people of Uruk complained to the gods, who realized that Gilgamesh needed somebody equal to himself to measure himself against. And so they created Enkidu, the savage, who grew up in the steppe, far away from human settlements. Here is the portion of the text describing him. On the steppe, and they're filling that in knowing the language pretty well, but that's probably what it is. She created Valani and Enkidu, offspring of, and there the text is unfortunately missing, uh, essence of Ninurta. Shaggy is his hair. Shaggy with hair is his whole body. He is endowed with head hair like a woman. The locks of his hair sprout like Nisaba. He knows neither people nor land. Garbled is he like Sumuquan. With the gazelles, he feeds on grass. With the wild beasts, he jostles at the watering place. With the teeming creatures, his heart delights in water. If you go back to the original, that's line 40. The full text refers to Enkidu several times using the Akkadian term Lulu, meaning primal or primeval man. It is used in some text in contrast to Mailiku, which describes the king as a thinking or de and deciding man. The terminology as well as his behavior and physical appearance suggests that we are dealing with this in this text with a being who is neither an animal nor a fully developed human being, a hominid to use modern terminology. Enkidu transitions from his wildlife and behavior to the life of culture with the help of a harlot, and he becomes a close friend of Gilgamesh. Texts like these are not common in the Sumerian and Akkadian literature, making it difficult to understand their full import. But we should keep in mind that Sumerian and Babylonian thinking, the beginning of human existence was neither a golden age nor a period of pristine simplicity. On the contrary, life was savage, and man differed little, if at all, from other animals. Primal man was a beast, and the Babylonian Enkidu was primal man redivivus. And um, so I guess that they would disagree with Rousseau. Biblical creation narrative. It would be difficult to deny that the ancient Near Eastern cosmogonic ideas discussed above were totally unknown in Israel. The biblical creation account was deconstructing the theories or speculations of origins common in the ancient Near East. 
Consequently, the biblical narrative can be used as well to deconstruct contemporary cosmogonies and natural evolution. The most striking difference between the ancient Near Eastern creation narratives and the biblical one is the total absence of a theogony in the biblical creation narrative. This is unique. The biblical creation narrative is an exquisite animal anomaly. The biblical text assumes the preexistence of and a radical distinction between Elohim or Yahweh and the cosmos. To the question that asks what there was before creation, the biblical answer is, in the beginning God created. He is not the self-created one, but the one who was and is and created everything else. First, the similarities between the biblical creation account and those from the ancient Near Eastern Near East are mainly superficial. The new biblical paradigm excludes any der derivation of the biblical view of creation from ancient Near Eastern sources and would consider such a derivation to be an attempt to force upon the biblical text what is foreign to it. Scholars are now more careful when seeking to identify ancient Near Eastern influences on the biblical writer. The truth is that, and again this is a quote, given our present knowledge it is difficult to prove that any single work is the source of Genesis 1. Second, in contraposition to the idea that the cosmos is a result of the co coming into being of God and everything else, surprisingly similar to process theology, the biblical text does not know anything about a cosmos that is the result of the self-evolving of God or that is emerging from within God. There is a beginning, but it is a beginning of creation, not of God. It is probably this biblical conviction that has contributed to the development of science in the Christian world in biblical theology, creation is desacralized and it is therefore open for human study and analysis. Third, since creation is not the result of a God who is evolving and the cosmos does not come into existence through inner struggles, pardon me, the cosmos does not come into existence through inner struggles. In ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies, evil is part of the creation process itself. Creation out of chaos, according to which God had to struggle with primeval forces of disorder, is not present in the biblical creation narrative. Creation is a result of God's effortless work. He spoke, it was done. Creation and the emergence of life. The life we experience is not an extension of the divine life, but a mode of life created by God and therefore essentially different from his. In order to communicate this idea, the biblical text describes creation as taking place through the divine word. The raw materials do not have within themselves the power to realize themselves. This power reaches them through the divine word. Life is created in the same way. The statement, let the land produce vegetation, may suggest the natural emergence of life from the inanimate, but this is, that is not the case. The idea is that the barren land is unable to produce grass and trees by itself. It needs to hear the voice of the Lord commanding grass and trees to come in ex into existence all over the ground. Concerning animals, we read, let the earth produce living creatures. This does not mean that the earth participated in the creature, creation of animals or that it had the potential to create, produce animals. It is only the divine command that creates the animals out of the earth. And skipping over a few... Um, the biblical paradigm depicts God who effortlessly creates life in its different forms, thus excluding the development of one, life, one form of life into a different one. This is an amazing thought in the context of ancient Near Eastern creation stories. The only thing that provides coherence and unity to the different expressions of life in the biblical creation narrative is the fact that there is only one creator. Creation in time. Ancient Near Eastern creation accounts do not date the moment of creation. They, like the Bible, speak about a beginning which includes the creation of time. There is no awareness of what is today called deep time. As we already pointed out, e Egyptian cosmogonies make reference to millions of years running from creation to decreation, and perhaps in that sense it would be possible to introduce some notion of deep time. In natural evolution, deep time is the creator, who brings into being the cosmos and all the forms of life found on our planet. If one doubts that, one only needs to read George Wald. Um, such ideas contrast in significant ways with the information provided by the biblical text in which a chronology of millions of years and the existence of a god of time are unknown. 
there is throughout the narrative a significant emphasis on time and its direct connection to the origin of life on the planet. But time is not raised to the status of creator. Time is created by God to frame his created acts. It is under his rule. When it comes to the creation of life on the planet, deep time is totally absent from the text. Everything takes place in a week. Origin of humans. The biblical narrative distances itself from ancient Near Eastern anthropologies by emphasizing the uniqueness of the creation of humans and the essential differences between humans and animals. It is obvious that the primeval human, who in ancient Near Eastern texts look and behave like an animal, is totally absent from the biblical text. Creation and the role of humans. The general tendency in ancient Near Eastern texts is to undermine the value and uniqueness of human life and existence. According to Enuma Elish, Ea, the father of Marduk, created humans from the blood of the rebellious god Kingu. They bound him, brought him to Ea, it's quoting, imposed punishment on him and severed his arteries. From his blood he formed mankind. He imposed on him service for the gods and thus freed them. Humans were created from an inferior evil god. Humans were the servants of the gods. That's what they were created for. In the biblical text, however, humans are created in God's image to enjoy fellowship with him. The image was something granted to them as a gift when they were created. As God's image, they were rational free beings able to communicate with God through language. And there's some text. In contrast to the biblical depiction of humans, ancient Near Eastern incipient evolutionary ideas devalued humankind. Animals and humans. Ba biblically, humans were differentiated from animals. I'm just summarizing a, a, a much larger section of that paragraph. Uh, first, both animals and humans were created by God, but only humans were created in God's image. This explains the fact that humans had dominion over the animals and that Adam did not find a suitable helper for him among them. Second, animals and birds were created or formed from the earth, but in the case of humans, God formed them from the dust of the ground and breathed uh, the breath of life into them. In the Sumerian text called Eridu Genesis, dated to around 1600 BC, the creation of animals is described as follows. When Anil, Enlil, and Enki, and Ninharsaga fashioned the dark-headed people, they made the small animals that come up out of, out of, from out of the earth, come up come from the earth in abundance, and had let there be, as befits it, gazelles, wild donkeys, and four-footed beasts in the desert. This is a case in which the origin of animals is somewhat similar to the biblical narrative. In the case of the Sumerian text, this happens through the cosmic marriage, an idea totally absent from the biblical cosmogony. The creation of humans is alluded to in the text, the gods fashioned humans, but no details are given. We should compare this text with another Sumerian one known as the Hymn to Angura. In it, the creation of humans occurs when the gods are fixing the destinies, creating the year of abundance and building the temple. In this text, the creation of humans is also related to the cosmic marriage and could be described as the emergence of humans. When the destinies had been fixed for all that had been engendered by An, when An had engendered the year of abundance, when humans broke through the earth's surface like plants, somewhat similar to the animals that we just read about, then built the lord of Abzu, King Enki, Enki the lord who decides the destinies, his house of silver and lapis lazuli. No distinction is made between the way humans and animals are created. They both broke through the earth's surface, emerging from it as a result of the cosmic marriage. The singularity of humankind at the moment of its origin is not emphasized at all. A third important distinction between humans and animals in the biblical account is found in the diet assigned to them. Eve, using the language of Genesis 129, clarifies that they can eat from the peri ace, the fruit-bearing trees of the garden. In Genesis, diet set humanity apart from the animal world. The animals were to feed themselves with green plants, but humans were only to consume seed-bearing plants and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. Self-evolving of humans. The idea that it is possible for humans to evolve from one level of existence to a higher one is found in Genesis. But it is not endorsed by the biblical writer. It is placed in the lips of the serpent after creation week. 
Instead of progress, humans were significantly dehumanized and in, unable to properly relate to each other and to God, hiding among the trees and putting on leaves. The fact uh, that an animal was instrumental in their fall suggests that they lost their dominion over the fauna. Uh, garments, of course, were made from the skin of animals. The humans are reduced to animal behavior. As a result of the fall of Adam and Eve, humans will also eat green vegetables or legumes, esib hasadeh, green plants of the field. So they're going down to the animal level. The human quest for self-development are evolving into the divine and the acquisition of self-preservation, immortality, proved to be a failure, which is interesting because they already had conditional immortality. Conclusion, ancient Near Eastern myths and speculations about the origin of life and its development from simple elements like water, matter, and time. These self-created elements are personified in the myths as divine beings who evolve or self-develop into the multiplicity of phenomena that we can now observe and experience. None of this is, properly speaking, natural evolution it is as it is understood today, particularly because of the me mechanism involved. But it does contain elements of the evolutionary ideology promoted today in some scientific circles. In that sense, the ancient Near Eastern view should be considered a part of the history of the idea of natural evolution. Once we recognize that such ideas were part of the culture and religious environment of the people of God of, in the Old Testament, the reading of the biblical account reve reveals the uniqueness of its cosmogony and anthropogony in revealing how Yahweh com uh, created the com cosmos, life in general, and human life in particular, the biblical text was indeed deconstructing the elemental evolutionary views presented in the Egyptian and ancient Near Eastern cosmologies, cosmogonies and anthropogonies. We can suggest, then suggest that the biblical text is to be used as a hermeneutical tool to evaluate and deconstruct contemporary scientific and evolutionary theories and speculations related to cosmogony and anthropogony. Kohelet, who is very much interested in creation, said it well. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, my take, I think that Rodriguez makes a very good case for a fundamental contrast between the Genesis creation account and the various ancient Near Eastern accounts. The latter seem to have much more of a self-development or self-organizational flavor to them. This is not evolution in the modern sense, but it does have an overall feel of evolution writ large. Rodriguez suggests that the biblical account could stand as a correction to modern developmental myths as it did for ancient developmental myths, which most of us would agree no longer are operative. I think that the data raises that question, but I think only a full frontal attack on evolutionary theory can finally show that in fact modern evolutionary theory has no more validity than ancient Egyptian or Mesopotamian speculations. But that's my opinion now, it's your turn. That was a long thing. I couldn't figure oh. out where to divide it in half and make sense out of it. So, uh, Very good, interesting. It um, raises the question, um, where did God come from? Uh, he didn't address that, of course. Uh, he, he well, actually, he, he did he, sort of he, sideways. He, sideways. God has always been there, so... so. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't make sense to ask where God came from, because that it, assumes it, that God uh, came from somewhere. It, in my mind, it raises the question. You know, uh, it's not a question of where God came from. It's uh, even uh, probably a simpler and more fundamental question: Where did anything come from? Uh, and uh, when I face that question, uh, as much as I love rationality. In cause and effect, reason, uh, it kind of falls apart there. Why is there a universe? If you want to get in that mode, why is there a God? You want to get into that mode? 
and I have to face the fact that uh, reality probably is not uh, one simple factor and we don't know what is involved here but it uh, does cause us to uh, realize that we should not be too simplistic in our evaluation. In the millennium, will it be okay if I say, God, where did you come from? I don't know. Well, if he, if he answers, I was always there, what would you say? You, you, there may be some convenience in uh, thinking about relativity and time, space, time warps, and so on. Too simple to answer, how come there's anything instead of nothing? Well, what's interesting is that, they, uh, that the, uh, the universe, according to standard theory, actually was created along with time. Or it, I should say, it came into being along with time. And uh, it came into being in a way that strongly suggests uh, a very careful crafting. And uh, in order to get away from that very careful crafting, people invented inflation because otherwise the universe looks like a put-up job. Well, maybe it is. Well, to answer Sister's question, I think God has a very simple answer. I am. Meaning, he's always been there, and he's always going to be there. What I find is fascinating is that in Hebrew, I am is in the perfect form, which is generally interpreted as, fa as past. So you could say, you know, I am and always was. But when he gives his name, I will cause to be, it's in the imperfect form. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, implying that not only was I the creator, but I'm continuing to keep it going. Does this imply that our time concept is uh, perhaps uh, too restrictive? Uh, I, I have to move beyond time when you I get into uh, ideas of eternity or especially uh, a past uh, uh, that has always existed. Uh, rationality get kind of weak there. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that if Einstein is correct and it probably at this point it's uh, hazardous to bet that he's not, um, that time and space are interconnected and in such a way that if you're going to create space, you pretty much have to create time as well. And matter and energy. Yeah, time, matter, energy, and space, all four. And of course, matter and energy are explicitly identified by Einstein. And that identification has enabled us to um, do such things as uh, create nuclear energy with its all of its positives and negatives. The um, question, where did God come from, is sometimes answered by where did the universe come from for those who are in a more materialistic mode. And it uh, does uh, kind of equalize the uh, the issue uh, but also I think uh, tells us uh, 
our rationality and our thinking is very limited here because we don't have any answer for either of those questions. Not only that, but uh, if we re restrict everything to what is usually called scientific, um, we can have no answer because at the origin all of our equations break down. They have zero as their denominator and you can't do that in mathematics. Yeah. But, but doesn't it interestingly raise an interesting question and that is are there not such things as timeless truths? Without timeless truths, one cannot extend the laws of physics back into uh, the beginning, can we? In which case, the whole project of trying to prove that God can't do this or that or the other thing kind of falls apart. I was interested in how many times he talks about the God's self-organizing, and it sounds like Modern evolution has all this self-organization built in. Um, there's no other way. Well, it certainly sounds like the Egyptians could have talked uh, to Stuart Kaufman quite easily. <laughs> what about the statement <clears throat> from Alan White that um, says war broke out in heaven before time began? And then there was another statement, when we are reunited with our Heavenly Father after time ceases. I don't know about uh, I, the, the one after time ceases, I haven't, I haven't seen and I'm not sure whether that means that uh, time on earth ceases or whether it means time throughout the universe and, and, and in fact one would have to say that it's possible that uh, that we're actually dealing with a multiverse or another universe that is parallel to ours and can interact but is not the same universe. And, uh, you know, maybe when Jesus was resurrected he was able to step into that universe and that's how he could go through walls. He just step into the other universe and then step around the, the barrier and come back in. This, inside. The, this is a very unscientific comment. Um, <laughs> we have two kids. When they were three years old, they didn't understand that after their birthday, they had to wait a full year till the next birthday. Time was absolutely impossible to understand. They barely could understand one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh is for Jesus. But that was with some coaching. We don't understand time, uh, even as adults. That's probably true. Um, we've gotten used to being able to fake it and to act like we understand time, but as far as actually understanding time, even the physicists will tell you that, that we have some guesses, but uh, we don't know which of them are correct, if any. There are those um, uh, theoreticians that suggest that time actually does not exist. It's just a figment of our imagination. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, I'm not quite. I'm not very comfortable with that one, but it's. it's we just get old and think we get old. Uh, time has nothing to do with it. What? Oh, you, no, uh, be an optimist. Well, time is something that most of us experience. Um, I would say all of it, but I guess three-year-olds have a hard time with it. Uh, but um, uh, you know. I think one of the things that you have to get used to, and 
and most of us do eventually, is that you have to get used to the idea that that our experience of something does not necessarily mean that we understand its nature, and vice versa, our not understanding the nature of something doesn't mean that we don't experience it and don't find that it's real. You know, and uh, if if I'm walking through the woods and suddenly a bear starts chasing after me, um, it's probably not a good idea to say, well, he really can't be there because I don't know where he came from. Uh, you know, what I find fascinating is these, the ancient Near Easterners were apparently drawing off of what was considered common experience. And I think sometimes that scientists are drawing off of what they consider common experience also. And because they've never personally witnessed a miracle, therefore nobody else can have either. And I think that that's, again, I think that's a, that's a mistake in judging reality by your own experience because there may be other people who have a uh, different experience that turns out to be substantially different from yours and yet uh, accurate and perhaps even more accurate than yours. There is a passage in the Old Testament which goes something like this, and I, I fear I'm badly paraphrasing it, but it said, you said in your heart I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to accomplish such and such and such, and I said nothing, and you assumed that I did not see what you were doing. There's some similar passages in the Old Testament, or pardon me, in the New Testament, uh, where God asks of the guy who's going to build big, bigger barns to house all his grain, this night your life will be required of you, and then who gets all this stuff? And uh, the same thing is, the, the, the same thing is said in a slightly different way in James where he he says, uh, don't say we'll be there uh, a, a year from now, we'll be in Thebes or wherever. He um, says, if God wills, we will go so and so and do such and such. And uh, I think that that's, a, it's a good idea to be, to be humble in that particular regard because you never know how it's going to turn out. Come in behind. This this lecture helped me understand better the story of Moses where God appears to him in the burning bush and who are you? Who should I say has sent me? I am that I am. And Moses presumably carries with him in his trip back to Egypt the book of Genesis. Right, that he's written over the 40 years in the desert. That helps a lot to explain maybe why God was acting in the way that he did by sending Moses, the most meek man, to point the world to the God that is the I Am in contrast to the gods of the Egyptians. just made me think of Nebuchadnezzar when as soon as I read what these I guess it was Egyptians though about how humans ate grass and they were naked and all that kind of thing I, immediately Nebuchadnezzar came to my mind and I wondered was God allowing him to experience something that he had once believed at least about the origin of human life. I don't know. I, I just thought, wondered if there might have been a connection. Maybe we'll have to ask him when I get to heaven, I guess. Actually, those kinds of thoughts and the development from them are where, uh, where a good share of theology comes from. To ask connections that suddenly kind of jump out at you and, and say, what, are, what is their meaning? 
and you'll notice a lot of things you know that are happening here are looking at connections and contrasts between the biblical record and between it and its Near Eastern uh, contemporary society, uh, pointing out that there's a lot of contrast. In two weeks when we get to uh, the chapter by Gerhard and I think it's Michael Hazel, um, uh, mostly Gerhard but with some updating by Michael, um, that we'll run into again the, the strong contrast that there is between the two. And uh, I think it's I think it's important for us to th think things that haven't been thought before and then to ask and what and what difference does it make? That's how science advances and I think that's also how theology advances by taking into account account connections and then asking what those implications are. Um, it'd be interesting to ask that question. Was, was Nebuchadnezzar being shoved back into the Enkidu stage <laughs> for seven years? Maybe to teach him how uh, not what a lot of nonsense that was. I mean, he had no, his, he couldn't, he could hardly think. I mean, his reason had left him, and he, that would see, maybe would lead him to yeah. think, oh, I think that's not a right concept. Well, you know, it's fascinating because when Nebuchadnezzar finally does come to his senses, he recognizes that God rules. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, the emphasis is no longer on is this not great Babylon which I have built. Uh, but, the, uh, but he recognizes that God sets up kings and he removes kings and, you know, if you go against God, well, some things can happen to you. I just kind of curious, uh, but I have several thoughts. Um, I guess I collected them too much. I should have said something earlier. But anyway, um, how much the antediluvian way of thinking, uh, they were very intelligent before the flood, um, how much that influenced the Babylonian, uh, Egyptian way of thinking. I'm sure there was some connection that, that wasn't totally um, lost at the flood, the knowledge of what they thought. And they were pretty mixed up in the way they believed. The other thing, an another thing that I was thinking was, <clears throat> usually the people that come here want to think. They're pretty intelligent. They're, they're able to reason. But we're so limited, very, very limited, even though we're pretty intelligent by the fact that we have sinned, we've lost our connection with God, we're allowing him to form that connection again, and he's changing us. He's giving us, uh, there's a statement in, De in Desire of Ages, I think it is, that if we totally commit our lives in uh, soul, body, mind <clears throat> to God, he will not only strengthen us physically, but help us mentally. And I think that's what we really need in order to understand. We can't do it in our total, just can't understand. But looking forward to what we'll have in heaven, our minds will be put back to the way they were so that we can understand deep thoughts that we just can't comprehend here. Um, mathematics is great. I love it. But... It's limited because our minds are limited. God is going to fix us so we don't have that limitation. Then we can understand as he understands and we'll strive throughout eternity learning more and more, always becoming more like God, but never reaching that. And I really look forward to that 
because it seems like we're knocking our heads against the wall so often. But I think we need to keep knocking. We need to keep trying. I agree. Just as long as we don't allow ourselves to become haughty. Because that's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He became haughty. He thought he knew it all. He thought he'd created that wonderful city of Babylon. And then God can't help us. We don't want to be in that situation. Well, actually, God did help Nebuchadnezzar, but it was yes, rather he did. painful. Yes, he did. <laughs> he helped him. Thanks. What this whole question about madness versus, say, wisdom and insight, I've been pondering this for some time. It, it struck me that some things cannot be overcome the way other things can be overcome. For example, if I decide to overcome truth, well, there are two possible outcomes of that effort. Either I win or I lose. If I lose, I learn something. But what happens if I win? Then all I've accomplished for all my labors is I've basically achieved a state of delusion. Why? Because truth cannot be overcome. The only thing that can happen is I can just convince myself that I've overcome it. The truth just is. It's interesting that the same word for being of truth ultimately is the same as for God. I am. Well, truth just is. It's what is. It's not something that I construct or that I decide to fight against or whatnot. The same could be said for wisdom. The same could be said for love. If you fight love, well, there are two outcomes once again. You either lose or you win. What happens if we lose? We call that falling in love. Isn't that interesting? But if we win, then what we've got is precisely the state of vanity, emptiness, pointlessness, meaninglessness that uh, Solomon described after he lost sight of what was the secret of his being. Well, um, <clears throat> next week we'll be talking about uh, when death was not yet. Uh, so it'll be a very interesting uh, comment. And, uh, and then uh, the week after we'll, uh, we'll come back to uh, ancient uh, Near Eastern cosmogonies. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to uh, discussing... Uh, the Rakia with our, our friends. Uh, we will keep you posted as things go on.